Boys, we made it. The 111th Grey Cup safely to <laughs> JC's home city. Well, kind of. Uh, I'm a, about an hour away. Home province. We'll take it. Huh. Same vicinity. Nobody from Vancouver lives in Vancouver. Right? This is true. As they say. Special episode of the Three Down Nation podcast after Randy Ambrosi's final State of the League address. Bald man, what would you think? It was a Randy Ambrosi State of the League address, right? I mean, I've been to three now in person. I, I believe I've watched them all dating back to his first in 2017. And at the end of the day, it's a lot of word salad. There are occasional nuggets that elicit positive answers. And to your credit, Mr. Dunk, you asked a tough question. And to Randy Ambrosi's credit, he gave it a good answer, which was good. There were some good answers. Uh, but again, there was a lot of talking in circles. There was a lot of hyperbole. Um, I think my least favorite part of it was the opening 15 minutes, which was apparently a TSN exclusive. Uh, the State of the League address is supposed to be a short address and then questions from the assembled media and for the uninitiated. The assembled media, which is getting smaller every year as travel budgets go down and down and down, gets 45 minutes for the whole week with Randy Ambrosi. After that, we generally do not get him. And the first 50 minutes of the address was just him and Kate Burness on the stage. And full credit to Kate. She did a great job. This is not about Kate Burness. It's about the principle, right? If the assembled media is supposed to get Randy Ambrosi for 45 minutes, then the assembled media should get Randy Ambrosi for 45 minutes. And it should not be a TSN exclusive. I don't know why that happened. One person led me to believe that Randy wanted somebody to come out and loft him some questions that maybe he could prepare for and overcoming for the first third, which frankly is kind of lame. But I digress. Jumbo cheese. Yeah, I thought it was a typical Randy Ambrosi performance, right? His his trademark saying a lot of nothing with just a sprinkle of something in there. There's nobody in professional sports who has the unique ability like Randy Ambrosi to have that amount of volume of speech without giving very little insight whatsoever. And I know I've been a little bit more positive leaning towards his overall tenure as commissioner as opposed to you, Hodge, but these are just not situations where he thrives. And while there was some decent moments as well, overall, I thought it was once again him talking over himself, sometimes working himself into trouble as he has in the past with some of his gaffes that have happened during these State of the League addresses. It did seem like he was a little more relaxed after Cape Ernest was up there, which was more. the idea, mm -hmm. because Randy Ambrosi feels like when he goes up there at the State of the League address, even though people can't see it, it's a room full of reporters and there's a lot of cameras there. And it's a big deal because this is going to go out, you know, not just to the hardcores and the people that check out 3downation.com every day. This could go out everywhere and anywhere across the country and potentially internationally. So Randy Ambrosi feels like it's a firing squad, which I don't think it's necessarily that way. And he's generally talking to a lot of people that he's dealt with fairly regularly during like, his tenure. How many reporters were there? Actual reporters. Was it more than 15? Probably not. No, less like, than that. There Part of that's are... just because it's on Tuesday, though. Which I was also led to believe, or have been led to believe in the past, that it got moved from Friday to Tuesday, specifically so Randy could get it over with early in the week, because that's how much he does not like doing this type of thing. And look, you can say, well, you know, yeah, it's a lot of pressure talking in front of all these reporters. And yeah, it's a lot of information to convey, and you got to be careful because you're speaking in an official capacity. Okay, but if you can't get in front of 15 people and answer questions, why are you the commissioner of a sports league? That, that would be my question. That's fair. That to me seems like a skill set that is extremely important to have if you're in that role. Um, let's talk about some of the positives, though. A real answer to the expansion question. Randy admitted that he's, he, you know, he said he's bullish on Laval and Halifax. I don't think we're any closer to expanding there than we ever have been. That being said, he did give a straight answer to no, he does not see the United States as a realistic expansion possibility for the Canadian Football League, citing concerns around the limitation of the ratio. He does not want to have a league where, you know, some teams are operating under one set of rules and another team is operating under other rules. And I guess that means he's not a big Major League Baseball fan. Or, <laughs> or are they all the same now? They're all the same now. They're all the same but now. Okay. The ironic part about that is it was the league 
to once upon a time during CBA negotiations that wanted to get rid of the ratio. And here's Randy and Rosie up here talking about Brady Oliveira and how the Canadian talent has never been better. But yet the CFL does not necessarily, how could I phrase it, do a lot to help grassroots football. You look at flag football going on. It's largely sponsored by the NFL and their logo is out there. And oh, by the way, the Saturday playoff games completely overlap now with the Canadian University, not just regular season games, but the biggest games of the year in the playoffs, except for the Vanier Cup because it's the week after the break. Another positive I thought was he gave a clear answer to JC's question, which was about the marketing money. As we know, currently in the CFL, teams can sign any player they want to any contract that has X number of dollars on the cap and X number of dollars off the cap. In other words, some of the money counts towards the salary cap. Some doesn't. The amount that doesn't is coined marketing money, colloquially. Um, it's, I believe it's called non-football services to the club. Yeah, officially. non-football related services. Related services in the collective bargaining agreement. He basically said, look, we audit all of the supposed marketing experiences that are or are not performed by players. And those services that are not rendered and are still paid to the player then get put directly against the cap. So in other words, if you're the Toronto Argonauts and you're paying Chad Kelly, let's say $100,000 off the cap in marketing money in 2024, if Chad does not perform any of those actual services, then all of that money would go against the Toronto Argonauts cap, which in a way does fix the problem, though it should be said, JC's question was, does this create a competitive imbalance in the CFL? And Randy took it as an opportunity to talk about offensive linemen going to the children's hospital (laughs) and playing with little kids and feeling like little kids. And it's like, great that players are going to children's hospitals. I think everybody is pro children in the hospital having a good time and forgetting about their illnesses for a little bit. You'd be hard pressed to find someone against that. But the question was about competitive imbalance. He did not address that, but he did provide some helpful explanation in terms of where that money is going and how maybe some teams can be prevented from grossly taking advantage of the loophole. Yeah, I thought that was some new insight in terms of the regulation, but there's a lot of questions that remained unanswered. And for those who maybe don't understand how this sort of setting works from a media perspective, everyone is politely asked to state a one question and a follow up. So if Ambrosi dances around too much. Sometimes you don't always get every aspect of the question that you want asked answered. I think one of the big remaining questions here in terms of marketing money is what exactly is that formula when the league's auditing to determine how much a player's uh, appearance is worth, right? What makes Nathan or how much is Nathan Rourke worth versus Brady Oliveira worth versus, you know, an offensive lineman worth in terms of a community appearance and what is your justification for that? Because if you're going to audit and you're going to punish teams based on those numbers, there has to be some sort of clear formula that sets a baseline for what each of these guys are worth, because some guys are simply worth more than others. That's why they're getting more marketing money. The big news to come out of it, at least in my opinion, I'm not saying this just because I asked the question, but was the fact that Ram D'Ambrosi, admitted the league has not doubled its revenue, which he touted when he was hired as commissioner, and the fact that he admitted that CFL franchise values are flat. Great to have an honest answer, like he gave for U.S. expansion and the marketing money question, but it was just surprising to me to actually hear that from Randy Ambrosi. But to his credit, at least in dealing with me personally, fellas, you guys can talk about it as you like, but I feel like he has been better in answering the question that's directly asked. And he did this, and he could have talked about the Hamilton Tiger Cats selling 40% of the Hamilton Sports Group, I should say, because the Canadian Premier League Team Forge FC is in there for roughly $20 million. And then that was one of the highest valuations in league history and kind of skirted his way around the question. But he answered it in an honest perspective, just like he did when he talked about U.S. expansion. I thought that was really intriguing and you wonder if part of the reason that he was so forthright with the u.s expansion and giving his opinion which he really does is because he's an outgoing commissioner there's potential for that i also think with your question in regards to revenue growth that's a difficult one to dance around because 
absolutely nobody out there believes that they've doubled re- doubled, doubled the revenue, right? That and Rosie said it how many times? Yeah, it's, first it's, year? it's a farcical. It was a farcical suggestion at the time, one of many that he's made over the years, speaking out of term and being hyperbolic. That has been largely his downfall, I believe, in these public but he addresses. Admitted and he that he was he, wrong. He admitted that he was wrong, or it so, fell short yeah. or underperformed. Is what he said. Credit credit to him for that, but you can't you can't dance around that when it's a pure fact, right? Nobody out there is suggesting that the league has double revenue because there is absolutely no metric by which you could state their growth, even though they've improved in some areas, has been to that level. Though he did say revenues are up, but we don't have the actual data. And to me, the most interesting part of his answer was he started talking about the biggest lever that the CFL has to pull Mm -hmm. are the media rights. And hinting and kind of saying in a roundabout way that in 2026, the CFL expects more money for their media rights than what has been reported the in and around $50 million that the league gets from Bell Media, TSN, RDS combined. And we don't know the number that the league has been getting from CBS Sports or CBS Sports Network or CBS. That that was my question. I thought Randy did not answer it at all. Uh, I asked... What is the data you can share about viewership on CBS Sports Network in the United States or CFL Plus internationally? Uh, He didn't provide an answer. He talked at length about how proud he is of the CFL and how he's hopeful that, you know, long term there could be growth internationally. And all of that is well and good, but he didn't even state. And let's remember, these two deals have been in place since 2023. He didn't even illustrate if there had been growth in viewership from 2023 to 2024. The only thing of substance he said is that during the 2023 season, CBS had the option to extend their partnership with the CFL, and they were excited to do so, claiming that they didn't even wait to the end of the season before saying, this is working for us, we want to continue on, and then later insinuating that the CFL's partnership with CBS is now tied through 2026. That's when TSN's exclusive broadcasting rights deal ends. And so the CFL has set it up in a situation where following the 2026 season, all of their media rights are up for grabs. And theoretically, I'd imagine they're hoping that a one-stop shop is going to come in, whether it's Amazon or whether it's Mm -hmm. Apple, and they're going to say, here's a boatload of money for all of your rights everywhere. Um, Or if it is still TSN or or maybe Rogers gets in the mix, we'll talk about Rogers and the Toronto Argonauts in in a second. Um, but again, it was an opportunity to say, hey, we've grown on American television or we've grown internationally. There was no data presented by Randy Ambrosi. Uh, one of the weirdest moments came, there was a lot of conversation about Chad Kelly. Uh, in my personal opinion, I feel like the league has kind of answered the Chad Kelly questions, but I know a lot of other reporters politely disagree with that. So they were asking about it. I respect their right to do so. Um, there was some confusion. Randy made it very clear that in the past, Some players have been kicked out of the league because they committed acts of violence. And he stipulated that he believes that's very different than harassment. Now, some people seem to be of the belief that harassment is violence. I've Googled it in some jurisdictions in Canadian crime, for instance. And this was not a criminal case for context. Chad Kelly was the subject of a civil lawsuit by a former Toronto Argonauts employee. But there are areas in the criminal code that do consider harassment to be violence, and there's areas that don't. So I appreciate that it's a gray area. I don't personally have an opinion on it, but I think some of the confusion from fans regarding what Chad did do stem from the fact that the CFL's violence or domestic violence or violence against women policy includes the word violence, whereas Chad committed harassment, in Ambrosi's words which at least in his view is different than violence. So I think it's a messy subject, guys. I thought Randy kind of addressed it. There was some substance there, Um, but especially with the Argonauts in the game this week, even though Chad is, of course, not playing because of a broken leg, I don't think this issue is going to go away. Yeah, I I thought it was interesting, his comments, just in terms of potentially addressing that policy and what it's called. He brought up the idea of renaming the policy, of splitting it into two different but policies. But we don't even know what the policy is. No, it's We've true. We've asked the league multiple they have times not provided not publicly available. about yeah. the gender-based violence policy. And not. You want to go on to 
Toronto? I was I wasn't gonna try. I was trying not to dominate the conversation, but sure, I'll keep talking. Okay. So Randy said he had a short meeting with Edward Rogers, who is of course the owner of Rogers Communications. He's worth more money than God. He also spoke to <laughs> Rogers CEO Tony Staffieri. Uh, the two of them did one media availability since essentially buying all of Canadian sports when they acquired not an availability. The, well, it wasn't availability. An interview it was, with it was Ron a, McLean. It was a sit down one on one with Ron McLean. You are actually one on two. It was two Rogers employees to, to one interview. Um, at the end of the day, it, it Randy admitted it was a short you know conversation that they had, but he indicated that he left uh, with a feeling that they were committed to the Toronto Argonauts. Obviously, that's a positive sign. I, I personally think that, you know, under the MLSC banner, which includes the Maple Leafs, the Raptors, Toronto FC, does not include, by the way, the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays have always been a Rogers only team, and they are a true Rogers powerhouse. They play in a Rogers owned building and are exclusively broadcast on a Rogers television network, and they compete largely head to head, as Justin lays out every week during the regular season when the Blue Jays and the CFL are going up against each other on television. Um, it's probably good news to hear that. Do we really know if Rogers is committed to it? Hard to say. Uh, it's possible that Rogers likes the idea of owning the Blue Jays and the Argonauts and having them on TV on separate networks competing. It's also possible that they want long term to bring the Argonauts under the Rogers banner and broadcast them. It's also possible that they're going to say, we don't want the CFL thing and try to get rid of it. Um, and go after an NFL team. There's been a lot of speculation about that with Ed Rogers. Absolutely. It's just speculation at this point. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess it's positive that Randy thought it was a positive meeting. Yeah, I, I thought just to backtrack a little bit to the media rights thing, because I think that's connected to this in a way. I thought it was interesting, typically when that has come up in the past, and I know, I believe you asked about it last year, Dunk. It's been asked about it in the past. Randy Ambrosi's boilerplate answer has always been Bell is a tremendous partner, TSN's amazing, yaga, 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 and maybe things will change in the future, but these guys are great. He didn't really say that this year when he brought up meteor rights of his own accord. It should be added. He didn't mention TSN at all in that particular segment of the conversation. Now, of course, TSN kicked off the thing. It's not to say that there's a deteriorating relationship there by any stretch of the imagination but i think with what's happening with rogers at the argos and some of those conversations as well as some of the possibilities in the future that you've mentioned like amazon and other things it, there's potential that some of these changes in the sports media landscape are opening up the league's eyes to considering other possibilities and that maybe is changing the official tune in terms of how they're speaking about TSN and right. Bell as they go into the final few years of this deal. I also think Randy at multiple times talked out of both sides of his mouth. Mm -hmm. He's kind of saying, well, we're in a great position because our media rights are coming up and that's going to be a windfall for us. And then simultaneously saying, mm -hmm. well, we as a league are so strong right now and that is setting us up to have great media rights. So it's almost like he's mixing up the chicken and the egg. It's like, is the league doing great? And therefore, the media rights deal will be great, or is the league great because the media rights are coming up and that gives them an opportunity to make more money? Um, there's times where the cart and the horse are kind of competing for who's out in front. But regardless, it, it, it was what it was. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, the, the Argonauts are wearing all white on Sunday. That's news. The Bombers are wearing all blue. That's news. The Bombers practiced on Tuesday. Is that a surprise? The Argonauts did not. Uniforms, though? Actually, it is because the Bombers wore white the last four Grey Cups. So I'm saying they won last week in all blue in the West Yeah, final. but they won the last four West Finals in blue. <laughs> well, that's not true. They won the 2019 West Final in white. Well, not all blue, though. Uh, that's the first West Final the Bombers have worn all blue. Uh, that is true, yes. I and so. the Argos wore all white they in wore Montreal. All white. And, and they won the East Finals. Blue. And the Argonauts wore all white when they played in Winnipeg in October and beat the Bombers. So that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I could think you guys are burying potentially the most interesting tidbit of the entire day. And that came out of the CFLPA's State of the Union address, which is sometime in December, we are going to get official report cards on all nine CFL franchises, similar to what 
the NFLPA has done for the last two years, I believe, where they grade out all of these franchises in terms of a number of criteria, like committed ownership, locker room standards, you know, the type of food they're fed, all these different things. We're finally going to get a CFL version of that. Apparently 495 players have answered this survey. It's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of those results. There'll be some great December content after all the coaching and head, head I was going to say head general managers, general manager positions are filled. Some teams do kind of have that though. They have a general manager and they have someone who actually does the job, right? <laughs> this is true. Um, I'm super excited for it. And actually full credit to the CFLPA. They're announcing this publicly. It's going to hold some teams accountable because there are teams who will listen to complaints from players over and over and over and not do anything. And then the second it becomes public, for fear of the bad headline, they're like, okay, now we got to change this. we got to do it. Um, the PA also cited free agency as a reason for doing this. They want players to make more informed decisions. So in other words, if a bunch of players in a certain market are saying, hey, our head trainer doesn't even believe us when we say we're good, right? Or, hey, and, and by the way, some examples from the NFL report cards that have come out. There have been teams with non-functioning toilets and showers. There have been locker rooms where there's rat infestations. There have been all Gross. kinds of things that you would never know about. So I think that it is really exciting that the CFLPA has done this. They also deserve credit because they had, as JC said, 495 respondents. I went and looked it up in 2023, the first year the NFL did its report cards, only 1,300 respondents. So for a CFL, right, that is less than a third the size of the NFL, it speaks volumes that their percentage of participation was much higher, right, on a per kind of capita rate. So clearly this is an init initiative that the players really care about. Um, the other CFLPA thing that I think is newsworthy is they are not satisfied with the health disclosures they're getting mm. from the CFL. Essentially, what they say they get on a year-to-year -year basis when it comes to injuries is like a PowerPoint presentation of like, here's what the injuries, kind of the trends were. And they want a full, they called it a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. They And I, boys, I love a good spreadsheet. They want to see all <laughs> of the do. raw data because they perceive that to be their data, right? It's the player's injuries. So the players should have the right to see exactly how many injuries of exactly what severity across the board happened, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. And I think it's kind of interesting that the league is unwilling to provide very detailed injury data instead resorting to, again, what the PA termed a kind of PowerPoint presentation type of uh, data set. The players also would like to see expansion, as would everybody in the league. And the other thing the players would like to see is the players being driven from a marketing standpoint. Solomon Alamemi, the president of the CFLPA, stated that he felt like the league likes to drive the teams, which you know, makes sense because ownership would like to do that. But I think it would benefit both sides if, for example, you had, let's say, Bo Levi Mitchell coming off a 5,000-yard season, been in the league for a long time, in an Advil commercial. And I thought about this because on the plane ride over, I was watching Monday Night Football on TSN, and one of the ads that has been running for a while now, but it just kind of clicked in as I was thinking about what types of questions I wanted to ask Ambrosi and the PA, was that you have Chase Brown, a Canadian running back in the NFL, doing it. Canadian Advil commercial. And then on top of that, when you watch TSN and you see the NFL games, at least every commercial set, or it feels like every other, but it's very often regardless, you see a commercial that's from NFL Canada that lays out some of the Canadians that are playing in the NFL in their hometowns, what positions they play, some cool pictures, some of their highlights, whether it's Chuba Hubbard, Josh Palmer, Javon Holland, even though some people might argue he's not really Canadian. I don't want to get into that bait debate right now excuse me but i thought that those are easy ways fellas for the cfl to push the players and if you have a star player perhaps somebody isn't a fan of a team like let's say in the nba it's lebron james or michael jordan there's always that debate right or anthony edwards ant-man now that everybody loves this young new sensation they might never have been a timberwolves fan but they love watching ant-man for example this guy's unbelievable i know you guys aren't basketball guys but ant-man's unreal so I think from Isn't that, that a perspective, superhero thing, Ant Man. Yeah, oh. Ant Man. Anthony, right. Dude, you watch him play basketball, you think he's a superhero. I'll check him out. Yeah, but anyways, if you had a superstar player that you marketed and made look cool from the league's perspective, I think you could draw in 
more fans and it would add another layer because you look at the other sports leagues and I don't want to compare it to this necessarily, but the NHL, the NFL, MLB, which other major one am I missing? NBA, we just talked about. It's a lot of the stars that are marketed. Mm. When you see commercials about guys, it's the stars. People know Austin Matthews, Sidney Crosby. The guys have been in the league for a long time. Alex Ovechkin. They're talked about so much. I think they're talked about in CFL terms within the media, Mm. but I don't think they're marketed enough to the average CFL fan, the fringe CFL fan, or somebody who could potentially be a CFL fan. Yeah, and I think the the direct quote from Peter Diakowski, the interim executive director of the CFLPA and (laughs) proud Vancouverite, was our players can sell Advil as well as anybody. (laughs) And I think that's true. Now, do CFL players necessarily have the built-in cachet that someone in the NFL does? I, I don't think that's necessarily but the you case. But you've got to start but somewhere. You've got to build it. And right? Randy Ambrosi did talk about the CFL with its partnerships punching above their weight. Yeah, so if that's the case, get the players in the mix. Well, it's only going to help everyone. Also, when you talk about marketing the stars of the NHL, we're talking about like five people, yeah. right? It's not like it's not like they're, oh, here's the third line right winger for the Boston Bru- Like, no, it's the same five players. So at this, if you're the CFL, like you could literally just be talking about Nathan Rourke, Trey Ford, Brady Oliveira, yeah. Bo Levi Mitchell, and... Like, Brady Oliveira should be marketed across this country. Absolutely. Canadian he boy, he's about to win the MOP. I would challenge the CFL, and hopefully the PA can help, I'm sure they would, to market Brady Oliveira. What is there not to like about this he's guy? Also got he's great hun- on the field. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers Yes, and on he Instagram. loves dogs. He saves dogs. In the off season and raises dogs and fosters dogs. What's the biggest hodge? You're an animal guy. Biggest animal company in the country. Animal company? Yeah, like just in terms of most like companies saving... are run by humans. Actually, <laughs> I mean, like pet food or saving oh, dogs. I don't know. Smart, maybe I don't know. Yeah, like Brady Oliveira. There you go. Boom. Marketing. It's not that hard. And I think he's a guy that, you know that would resonate. Canadian homegrown boy. Justin McKinnis, same thing. You guys mentioned and, Nathan Rourke. Yeah. I'll add this because I want to give a little bit of pushback. Randy said it today. I see people make this point all the time. Well, Canadian players are so good now, we don't need the ratio. Well, Brady Oliveira played FCS football mm-hmm. where he was like a good running back. If he wasn't Canadian, probably doesn't sign a CFL contract coming out of college. Yeah. There are higher prospects that are available. Um, Justin McInnes did nothing for the first two years of his career. As a first-round pick, didn't have a 1,000-yard season until his fifth year, which is this year. He had more receiving yards this year than the first four years of his, of his career combined. Yeah. If there is no ratio, Justin McInnes gets one year in Saskatchewan, and then he gets shown the door because it's like, oh, you did nothing. Okay, fair enough. So I think we're mixing up the cause and the effect. Mm. We don't have great Canadian talent, therefore get rid of the ratio. We have great Canadian talent because of the ratio. Brady Oliveira didn't start the first two years of his career. Part of that was due to injury, but he played behind Andrew Harris for two full seasons before getting the opportunity to start. Justin McInnes needed time before he was ready to start. Trey Ford, needed time before he was ready to start. Mm-hmm. Nathan Rourke sat behind Michael Riley for an entire year before he was ready to start. So when we talk about great Canadian players, let's also remember that the ratio isn't just about, oh, we need to keep these guys on rosters. It's we need to give teams an incentive to develop them properly because Brady Oliveira was not Brady Oliveira the day he left campus at North Dakota. He became Brady Oliveira over time and uh, I agree, Justin. I think he's going to win MOP. Some housekeeping notes really quick. Wednesday is media day. We will have one-on-one conversations with a ton of members of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Toronto Argonauts. We are also on Thursday going to be at the CFL Awards. That'll be fun. You think it's Brady for MOP? Just, JC, what do you think? Uh, I voted for Bo, so I think it's Bo. Figured you would. I do You're think crazy. Bo has a real shot. I really do. What about, in fact, you guys can talk for a second. I'm going to go ahead. That's me. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go through, go down the list. You better defend words. yourself. Well, I, I, I think he's done something this season that nobody's done since 2018. I think that is remarkable. And I also think 
on a non-playoff you, team. Yeah, I don't really care about that. I mean, it's an individual award. It's not a team award. Greg Oliveira is the best running back in the CFL. I think that's unquestioned, but he hasn't put up that many more yards than William Stanback. Only Levi Mitchell has a thousand, more than a thousand more passing yards than the next guy in the league. That's a substantial number. There are quarterbacks out there who've started several games who barely have that amount of passing yards, right? Like he, he's one Davis Alexander ahead of everybody else right now. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable to me. I assume we're all in agreement that Brady will win most outstanding Canadian yes, over yes. Isaac Adiemi Berglund. No disrespect to Isaac Adiemi Berglund. Great year. I don't think that vote's going to be close. Um, I think last year was 57 voters at the national level. If there's 57 again, I'm guessing it'll be 56 to 1. Because there's always that one person who's like, no, I'm the smartest one in the room. And I see Isaac Adeyemi Berglund for what he really is, but whatever. Um, most outstanding defensive player, we already know that Justin's going to pick Roland Milligan Jr. I voted for Tyrese Beverett. JC, who did you vote for? I voted for Roland Milligan Jr. And he would have had my vote for MOP if he had been eligible as well. I thought he was remarkable this season and difference maker at a position that often doesn't have very many difference makers. I was watching the East final from the press box in Winnipeg. And when Tyrese Beverett took a terrible pass interference penalty late in that game to help seal the win for Toronto, I remember thinking maybe I did vote for the wrong guy. And then I watched the West final and the boundary side of Saskatchewan, the secondary got shredded. And then I went, okay, never mind, We're good. Um, let's talk about the most outstanding offensive lineman. I voted for Ryan Hunter. Who did you two vote for? Same. I also voted for Ryan Hunter. I think both him and Logan Furland you can make an argument for because of their versatility. Yeah. But Hunter spent more time at left at left tackle, which is just the most important position on that offensive line. Well, and if you need a tiebreaker, and the voting was done before the East and West finals, mm-hmm. respectively, but if you need a tiebreaker, one of those guys is playing this week. The other one's not. Most outstanding special teams player. I think we are all in agreement that Janarian Grant will win this award. Keep it moving. Should yeah. have been Jake Julian, but yeah. Sean White, I'm sure, will enjoy the extra trip to Vancouver because the CFL will pay for his gas. Well, from he lives White here, Rock. so it's... Well, that, yeah, they'll pay for his gas from White Rock. That's true. Maybe you can you catch him at home with him. I, I should have carpool. We, like, we, we live should've. very close to each other. Most outstanding rookie, I voted for Nick Anderson of the Edmonton Elks. Are we in agreement that he will win? I also voted for Nick Anderson. Shamar Bridges, I'm still not convinced, should have been the nominee out of the East, but that's okay. He still had a great year. He just he didn't play the last one. Uh, and finally, Coach of the Year. This feels awkward after the two games this past mm-hmm. week when their teams <laughs> kind of got shown up. Corey Mace and Jason Moss. I voted for Corey Mace. Who did you two vote for? Corey Mace. I voted for Corey Mace. I think too often we give this award to somebody a year too late rather than a year too early. That if Jason Moss wins, I think that will be the case because his team dominated this year. He should have won it last year. Corey Mace deserves it this year for what he was able to do turning around Saskatchewan. I don't think Jason Moss's team dominated this year. I think they dominated the first two thirds of the year. That's a fair assessment. But they did have the best record in the CFL, and so one could argue that the award should go to him. Um, if you're watching on video, the Vancouver sky, which was emitting almost no light when we started, is now <laughs> emitting absolutely no light. So we apologize for the looking sun has set, like a bunch of gray blobs on your screen. Um, any final thoughts? We'll start with JC. I'm going to put jumbo cheese on the spot. Uh, well, I'm excited to to really get into the nitty gritty of it tomorrow that's where i think the most interesting stories of the week pop up is media day when you get a chance to chat with some of these guys one-on-one that you haven't had the chance to talk to throughout the year or maybe don't get as much spotlight put on them there can be some really interesting comments made i'm excited to get into that tomorrow and keep it locked on three down nation to see all of those quotes as they come in if you have ideas hit us up too at three down nation on Twitter or X. And as JC said, keep it locked to 3 donationcom If you have good ideas, reach out to us on Twitter. If you have bad ideas, send them to somebody else. <laughs> no, we want to hear all your ideas. All the ideas, gonna... really? And I think people, as a final thought, are going to think that this Grey Cup's pretty cool. We've been around the city. We were at BC Place, a couple of the convention centers where a lot of the action is going to be taking place. We saw the zip lines. I don't know if I can do the one over the water or if you guys are too, but... It looks really nice here. Ideally, there's some sun that peeks through, but it is Vancouver in November, which means gray and rain. Yeah, the the rain has the possibility of putting a damper on the week, but you could not ask for a more beautiful setting 
for a Grey Cup festival right there, directly on the water. A lot of the festival is centered around where the Olympic torch is for those people who might be familiar from, from 2010. It's just absolutely spectacular down there. Hopefully, it turns into a real party. That hasn't started yet, but that will be in the coming days. This is my first time in Vancouver, only CFL City I've never been to. Uh, initial impressions, it's a little nicer than Regina and Hamilton. No disrespect to those two cities. <laughs> little um, and I can say that because I'm from Winnipeg, and Vancouver's <laughs> a little nicer than Winnipeg, too. Uh, I will not be doing the zip line. I would rather die than do the zip line. Terrified. Not even, I'm not even going to look at people doing the zip line at all, but if one of y'all wants to do it, you're welcome to do it. Um, today was fun. It was a good first day of Grey Cup. I'm excited for the rest of the week and stick to, stay tuned. Again, we got 10 articles up today. We're going to have more by the time end of day hits on Tuesday. We're grinding it out. We're getting the content. We're asking the questions that people want and stay tuned for the rest of the week. It's going to be a good one. Yeah.